Thank you very much for that scripture reading and for that song. As we've looked this week at faith, one of the ways that we've seen it is that it is a function of sight, right? Not physical sight, but spiritual sight. So for God to be our vision, it means that we, we I like to say it, we see what he sees. We see what he sees. He becomes our, our vision and our guiding light through all of life. Today, I wanted to consider with you this theme as the topic in the bulletin indicates looking for faith, looking for faith. It was the Passion Week. That's what we tend to call it. Um, passion sometimes, often, is not pictured as something good because passion often is self-centered. It's just into taking and not into giving. But did you know Christ had a passion? And as he came to his disciples this week that we're talking about, he says, it's translated with desire, I have desired. But the word there is passion, passion. He had a passion. But we know where the week's going, right? We know the story. We know why we call it the passion, because it leads to what event? The greatest passion that he had. Why did he come to this earth? He came to give, and to give to that extent. It was the first day of the week, the week that the Passover would come. The Passovers for millennia, not just hundreds of years, but thousands of years, had pointed to this event. Um, the Passovers looked back to when the angel passed over the children of Israel there in Egypt, but the Passovers, Passovers also looked forward to that blood that would cover their doorpost, right? In a real, real way. Jesus was riding on the donkey's colt, going into Jerusalem, up Mount Zion. Donkey's colt. I think you have horses here. I haven't seen any donkeys. I have, my friends wanted to go riding, but no one said they wanted to ride a donkey's colt. Have you ever thought about that? What was that all about? Well, consider this verse. This is actually where it comes from. Zechariah 9, verse 9. Rejoice, this is poetry, by the way, and I tried to put it so that it looks like poetry. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Matthew 21, 5 and John 12, 15 actually quote that verse in re referencing the story of Jesus riding into Jerusalem. I don't know that we have any other story in the Bible of Jesus riding, right? He's always walking. He's walking. Walked everywhere he went. That's what people usually did back then. So, let's follow Mark's account in re. re telling the story to us, chapter 11. And let's add some things as we go through today from Luke, Luke's account, which is in chapter 19. Uh, if you study carefully these Bible stories, you will find that as eyewitnesses often do, they don't always agree on the sequence of events or the details. And it's all, sometimes a challenge to figure out which order these things came in. And... Um, we don't try to settle all of that right now, but we are blessed by the events of the story. In, in Mark's account, 9, uh, 11, 9, and 10, he records that, that as Jesus was riding this animal in, this small animal, they were saying, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the kingdom of our father, David, that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. There almost seems to be a structure in that. They start out with Hosanna, they end with Hosanna, right? And they repeat the phrase, coming in the name of the Lord. Um, 
Hebrews like to do repetitions in, in various structures of their, of their statements. Very interesting statement here that they would praise the coming king in these words. Let's connect, if we can, this kingdom of our father David to the donkey's colt and the king riding on it that Zechariah said is lowly. After all, can you imagine any earthly king riding sort of in his triumphal entry into his capital, picking the colt of a donkey to ride on? What would a king on this earth, contaminated by the lie that we've been studying this week, what would he be riding on? Probably some mighty stallion, right? Some, you know, probably a white one, just really looking big and important and, and look at me type of thing, right? Let's connect the kingdom of our father David to this donkey's colt. This king that Zechariah said was what? Lowly, lowly, amazing picture. Remember Gabriel's words to Mary way back at the beginning before Jesus was even born. Speaking of the son that she would bear, he shall be great. Do we know what that means? He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. Do we know what it means to be highest? And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. There's the prophecy. Was David the first king of Israel? No, he was not. Was he the greatest king of Israel in terms of kingdom and, and, and power and wealth and all of that? No, his son was, right? His predecessor was the first king. So he's in between this first king and this, this greatest king. But what is it about David? You know, we could ask the question, what is it about David that made him, as the Bible says, a man after God's own heart? It's not talking about his sins and his failures. I'm not talking about that at all. I mean, those actually kept him from building God his house. And it messed up his family something terribly. But the fallout of his mistakes he lived with to the end of his life, his descendants lived with it for generations. As the Bible says, unto the third and fourth generation at least. But what was it that made David a man after God's own heart? The throne of David. Why is this the throne that Christ will sit on? That was from Luke 1.32, the words of Gabriel. The kingdom of our father David, the word lowly, the word great, the phrase, the title, the son of the highest. And then this throne of his father, David. Do we really understand how you put lowly and great together? I would say we don't unless we understand the truth. What the Bible calls the truth. And it's the truth about God. The one who created everything, the one who sustains everything, who is indeed in his very being the greatest. And yet, what is he like? What is his character? Is he, like we've asked this week, is he like the devil says he is? Is he self-exalted and therefore we can live that way too? We can be like the Most High? in the way the devil said we should be? Or do we really know how to put together lowly and great? What is greatness? What is David's story? You probably know it to some degree, but let's just review it. It's, this is a really quick overview to see if we can grasp a little bit better why he was a man after God's own heart. David was not the oldest in his family, right? Apparently he was the youngest, if I recall correctly. Um, but he was, I don't get the impression that he was babied as the youngest often are. He had responsibility. He was faithful in his responsibilities. He was valiant. He learned, apparently in those hours, taking care of those sheep out there in nature. 
which is our lesson book, right? He learned the reality of God in his presence, in his sustaining power, and the fact that he could depend upon God. And when the animals came that most people would have been afraid of, right? He was fearless. And so when he meets the enemy of Israel, that every one of the soldiers in Israel's army was afraid of. Is he afraid? No. He knows the God of Israel. And so we know the story about David and Goliath. Da David was anointed by Samuel. Samuel was told by God, go and anoint one of Jesse's sons. And so Samuel himself, you know, he went through these sons one by one by one, and he was certain, you know, some of these sons that really looked like kingly stuff would be the one. And no, it was the shepherd boy. Anointed by Samuel to be king. But was the throne empty? No, it wasn't empty. There was a man on the throne who was the first king of Israel. And we remember that story as well. Saul's on the throne. And at first, because of David's valor with Goliath, Saul does what? He gives him one of his daughters. And David is welcome. But then, of course, you know, you're king, and here's this young guy who they're, they're singing his praises. Saul has killed his thousands, and David has killed his ten thousands. That sounds a little threatening to you, especially if you are not lowly, if you think greatness is self-exaltation, and you've got to hang on to what you want. And you've got to watch out lest somebody else knocks you down and puts themselves up. Saul's on the throne and he begins to be get threatened by David. And finally, he tries to kill him. And David has to do what? David has to flee. He has to flee. How long is David a fugitive? Going from town to town, caves and, and hiding. Um, many of the Psalms were written during the time that David was fleeing for his life. And so he's a fugitive, and more than once Saul is in his grasp, right? It would be nothing for David to just do away with Saul and take the throne. He's anointed, right? He's the, he's the next king. Does that what David does? No. David does not do that. David does not take, he does not take what is even rightfully his. He does not take it. What does he do? The Bible says he waits on God. Have you wondered, what, wondered why the Psalms say over and over again, wait my soul upon the Lord. Wait upon him. You know, if we understand true greatness, if we understand what it means to be a man after God's own heart, a woman after God's own heart, we understand this principle of waiting. It's not easy for us if we are self-focused, self-centered, impatient. Finally, Saul is killed in a battle. It's not a pretty scene. It's not even totally the enemy's fault that he's killed. He's just wounded. And there's a couple stories in there, but it looks like he's involved with ending his own life in some way. And of course, Saul's not the only one who dies. Saul's sons die as well. And who was the son that David was closest to? Jonathan. Jonathan. So David loses his best friend. And David does not rejoice. He does not rejoice. He mourns. He laments. And it's an amazing story. His, his lament is recorded there for us in the Bible. How are the mighty fallen? He, he mourns and mourns. Not just for Jonathan. I think he mourns for Saul too. He's a man after God's own heart. What will God do when his enemies are finally gone? What will he do? David then goes to Hebron and he waits there. And the men of Judah one of the tribes of Israel, they come and they anoint him king. Wait, now I thought Samuel had done that way back, you know, years before. 
Samuel was God's agent, right? Samuel's anointing was God's choice. What are the people doing here? They are saying, yes, we want you to. We want you to. But it was only Judah, right? And if you read the story carefully, the details that we don't often remember, one of Saul's surviving sons takes over the others, and for two years he's, he's reigning over them. And then there's in some intrigue and, and stuff, and, there, and he gets murdered by some people. And then the rest, seven years later, the rest of Israel comes and anoints David. So, got the picture of the story? God anoints him. David waits then for what? He waits for God's timing. He waits on God. And he waits, in essence, for the people then to anoint him. I submit that is the throne of David. That's the throne of David. So how do we apply that? Jesus, the anointed of God, is waiting for the people to anoint him. He's waiting for the people to anoint him. He will sit on the throne of David. Or, using other imagery, he's the bridegroom, but he's waiting for the bride to be ready for him. He's waiting for the bride to be ready for him. This is no sh shotgun wedding, as we, as we call it, right? He's not going to force the bride to the altar. He's waiting. He's waiting. He will rule over those only who crown him king, who anoint him king of their lives. What a picture. Sitting on the throne of David. Let's grasp at this man who's willing to ride in his triumphal entry a donkey's colt. Do you see what it is that heaven considers greatness? It's lowliness. It's lowliness. What did he do with Israel during the, his time on earth? I believe parallels what he's doing now with the entire world. What he's doing with the entire world. If we understand prophetically where we are in time, we have an abundance of lessons to learn from what Jesus was doing as he's riding in on this donkey on this day, first week, first day of the week of his Passion Week. Luke's account tells us what happens as he's riding the cold. And when he was come near, talking about the city, he beheld the city and wept over it. Ever see a president on their inaugural parade weeping? Weeping? Can you imagine it? What would happen? Washington, D.C., you know, this inaugural parade coming into his inauguration. And they... Television cameras zoom in on the president, and he's just, he's weeping. But I ask the question, are these silent tears just running down his face? Let's let Ellen White describe it. Desire of Ages 575, paragraph 3. His eyes filled with tears, and his body rocks to and fro like a tree before a temp the tempest, while a wail of anguish bursts from his quivering lips, as if from the depths of a broken heart. Not silent tears of gladness, but tears and groans of insuppressible agony. Agony. What's going on? I really strongly encourage you to read pages 575 to 578 there in Desire of Ages. She unwraps the scene. What's buried in this little phrase, he, he's weeping, and then a the few words surrounding that, just an amazing description I want to highlight just some of the key thoughts from Desire of Ages. <clears throat> what she talks about to start with is this. It was the sight of Jerusalem that pierced the heart of Christ. He saw what she might have been had she accepted him who alone could heal her wound. He had come to save her. How could he give her up? How could he give her up? 576 paragraph 1. Again, from what we've been studying this week, to see what might be. What do we call that? That's a vision of, vision of faith. That's a vision of faith. 
He put his vision of faith into words in a lament. And Luke again records those in 1942. If thou, speaking to Jerusalem, singular, if thou hadst known, even thou at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace. But now they are hid, hid from thine eyes. He's seeing something. Is Jerusalem seeing it? They refused to see what he saw, to believe what he believed she could be. And he's weeping uncontrollably. His body's rocking to and fro. Might have been and would have is used repeatedly in Desire of Ages, page 763, 576, paragraph 3. Along with Ellen White's statement over and over again, he saw, he saw, he saw, he saw what might have been, he saw what would have happened. Again, the ability to see God's plan in my life, in the lives of those around me, is what we need to have. We need to see that. We need to see that. Not only to see it with some superficial sense. We need to embrace it. And then Ellen White says, but the bright picture of what Jerusalem might have been fades from the Savior's sight. 577 paragraph 1. But more than realizing her failure to accept his vision of faith, another vision we see now is clashing with an agonizing contrast, this vision of faith. He, he, he can clearly see what might have been, but he's seeing something else now. He saw Jerusalem encompassed with armies. He saw the wretched inhabitants suffering torture. The beautiful palaces destroyed, the temple in ruins, and of its massive walls, not one stone left upon another, while the city was plowed like a field. Well might the Savior weep in agony in view of that fearful scene. What is he seeing there? It's the future, right? It's what's coming. That was paragraph two of page 577. And Luke actually in his account records Jesus after he laments that she did not see the things that belong to her peace what was going to come, what was going to come in the future. Um, I'm hoping at some level you're understanding the parallels between what is happening with Jesus and Israel and what's happening with us in this world right now. Do people know what's coming? They have no idea unless they read the prophecies what the future holds. But more importantly, do they see the vision of, of what God's plan has been for their life? what the vision of faith is all about, the faith that is alone the victory. What is that vision of the future? And I say here, that is not the vision of faith. What is it the vision of? It's what we call foreknowledge. It's the vision of foreknowledge, right? And so the story illustrates clearly for us that God sees through both faith and through foreknowledge. He sees what might be, and he sees what will be. But I ask the question, and it's a vitally important question, which vision motivates him? What vision motivates God? Is it the vision of what he knows will happen? If we believe that, we would be Calvinist, because Calvinists believe in predestination, that the future has been determined and God knows it and he treats some people that way because they're going to be saved and he treats other people another way because they're going to be lost and there's nothing you can do about it. We're not Calvinists. That aspect of John Calvin's teaching we repudiated because I think this is the best explanation. God does not operate on the vision of foreknowledge. He operates on the vision of faith. And what does he see for every creature he has created? He sees what they can be. 
what his plan is for them. Is it a challenge? Not for him. His, his faith is, is unlimited, right? The challenge is for us. You mean, God, you really plan that for me? Or for that person, you really, you really have something that that person can do? Look at what a mess they are, you know? Look at how they don't even know the very basics of life and, and unselfishness and maturity. And that lowliness is greatness. What, what vision motivates God? Paul actually asked about these very people, the Jews, this question. And this has become a, an amazingly significant passage to me. For what if some of them did not believe? Let's just sort of unwrap it as we go. What if some of the Jews did not catch God's vision of faith? What if they did not believe what God believed? What if they refused to respond to his plans for them with agreeing, with submitting, with embracing that, with saying, yes, I want to do, God, what you want me to do. I want to be what you want me to be. I want to, to embrace the fact that lowliness is greatness. I don't want to exalt myself. I want to be willing to humble myself. And I want to serve you. He asked the question, what if some do not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? What's Paul's answer? God forbid. Let God be true. We've been talking about the truth this week in contrast to the lie. When it says let God be true, that's an affirmation of the truth. Let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written. Who does he quote here? Do you have any idea? He quotes David. Do you have any idea where he's quoting David from? A high point of David's life or a low point? It's a low point. It's after his most terrible fall into sin. Psalm 51, his prayer of repentance after he stole another man's wife and had the man murdered. In that amazing prayer, David says that thou, and who's David talking to? He's talking to God. That thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. That's Romans 3, verses 3 and 4. But did you notice it here? Will the response of unbelief make the faith of God without effect? And Paul says, no way. No way. What's going to end up? God is going to be justified. God is going to be justified. So I ask the question, what is the most important justification by faith that the great controversy plan, the plan of salvation results in? It's not my justification by faith. It's God's faith showing that he is just, that he will overcome in the whole thing. And this is the way I like to describe it. God's faith, his vision for us, revealed in the faith of Jesus what he did in pouring his life out for the human race will justify us completely if we accept it and embrace it. So if we, don't, if we don't respond with unbelief, his faith will justify us completely to the end. We'll be in that group at the end of Revelation that says, Revelation 22, 11, he that is just, let him be justified still. But if we reject it, as many of the Jews did, Paul was talking about, Jesus was experiencing there, he's weeping over the situation, there's just agony, the, the very vision that he came was not being realized. If we reject it, as they did, his, God's faith, Jesus' faith, will still accomplish its most important goal. What is it? His faith working by love to the end will justify him against the lie of the devil. This will be the ultimate victory in the great controversy. So whether I'm part of the victory team or I'm part of the failure team, he's going to win. Does he want me with him? His tears over Jerusalem tells me he wants me with him. He's in agony to think that he's going to lose some of his creatures. I mean, if it was just one of them, I think we're told that he would have done what he did, right? Just one of them. So it means that just one person, he's going to weep like we saw him weeping there. 
back to the Passion Week. Jesus closed his lament with the words, Thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Luke 19.44. This word visitation is the word episcope. Made from two words, epi upon and scope, look. So, at the end of the 70 weeks of Daniel, Jesus came to look over, to look upon, or in other words, to investigate Israel. The question is, what did he find? What did he find as he visited them in this way, as he visited them as one in charge? Because the idea of episcope is where we get the word bishop or overseer from. He's in charge. He's coming down to look things over. What does he find? Well, the story should tell us what he found. Did he find what he was looking for? Mark continues the story. Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple, and when he looked round about upon all things, and now as eventide was come, he went into Bethany with the twelve. Mark eleven eleven. And again, I ask the question, what did he see when he looked? You notice that there's in that text. We often just go right by it. He goes into the temple and he looks around at everything. What did he see when he looked? He's looking. It's his day of visitation. It's his job to look upon everything. In spite of his vision of foreknowledge, I believe he was still looking for something. He was still looking for something. The next 12 hours told what he found. He spends the night in prayer, Desire of Ages, page 581, paragraph 3, and apparently not just praying, but also fasting. Because what happens? The next morning, he's on the way into the city, and he's hungry. Martha didn't have a chance to feed him. He probably told her, no, more important things right now. More important things. He saw a fig tree. He looked for figs. We know the story, right? We know the story. Or do we? That's my question. Do we really know the story? He went back to the temple. He found it defiled. And he says to them, you have made it a den of thieves. Mark eleven seventeen. And I ask the question, do thieves give or do thieves take? Do you see the two principles right here? It's contaminated with the principle of the lie. God's house, the sanctuary, was to be a place, as we studied this week, where God shows how much he gives. How much he gives for sinners. Giving, giving, giving. There's life, there's blood, there's light, there's bread, there's incense. Just in intercession, all of this. If, we had really see, if Jesus had really seen that in the temple, he would have seen weeping and, and confession and repentance. He would have seen the rich people helping the poor who couldn't buy their sacrifices. Instead, what's happening? They're, they're robbing them. Can you see why he's so upset? They brought this junk into his house that doesn't belong there. This is my father's house. What are you doing with this stuff in my father's house? And get it out of here. Read the picture. It's an amazing picture. I mean, they thought three years before when he did the same thing that they would never do it again. Run from him when he says to get out of there. But yet, his appearance at that time is like the king and his majesty. And they cannot but run from him. He cleanses the temple again. The next day, the fig tree, we're told, was dried up from the roots, Mark eleven twenty. In case, as if it would ever happen, in case did, Jesus didn't see it, Peter said, Master, behold, look, look, look at the tree. The fig tree you cursed has withered away, Mark eleven twenty one. Jesus' response, I believe, at this point, Jesus' response to Peter, and he's talking to all of them, tells us what he had been looking for, what was missing from Israel, what was missing from the temple? What is essential for life itself? After all, that's why he said, I'm going to make that fig tree an illustration of how important this thing is. What was it? Most translations read, have faith in God. Mark eleven twenty two. 22. But let's look at some other translations. Have God's faith. Bible in basic English. Have the faith of God the Dewey Reims version, and a couple literal, literal translations, Green and Young, have faith of God. Jesus is telling us, I have a vision, the Father has a vision. I want you to take this faith and I want you to keep it. See what he sees, what I see by faith, embrace that vision. How important is it? 
He tried to show us how important it is. Did he ever find it? He's looking, looking, looking. So I asked this question. Did he ever find it? Someone who saw what he saw with his eye of faith? Did he ever find it? Remember any stories about that? What about, what about this Roman centurion who had a servant that was sick? And he says, Master, come heal my servant. And Jesus says, I will come. And he says, no, 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 no. I'm not worthy for you to come to my house. Just speak the word only and my servant will be healed. Is this man, a, even though he's a centurion, he's a Roman, does he have the eye of faith? Is he lowly? He's a man in authority, but he knows how authority works, godly authority. I tell somebody to do something, they do it. You're a man in authority, speak it, and it'll happen. And Jesus says what? Jesus heard it, he marveled. This is not even a Jew. Has no background of growing up with the Torah, with understanding the acts of God's faith and love through history, and yet he's grasped it. He marveled and he said to those that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. Matthew 8, verse 10. He's looking for it. Where did he find it? He found it in a centurion, a Roman at that. Another time, he's down along the borders of Israel, near the Mediterranean Sea. And there's a woman from that culture, that ethnic group that the Jews dis despised. And her daughter is sick. And she says, Master, heal my daughter, heal my daughter. And Jesus, testing his, testing his disciples and testing her, acts like he's ignoring her. And finally, the disciples say, send her away. She's just so insistent she won't give us any peace. And so Jesus says to her, what? It's not good to give bread to the dogs. I gave bread to one of your dogs here this week. You know, they enjoyed it, right? But this woman read through that, that thing that Jesus was doing, and there was something I'm sure about his countenance, that she said, aha, he has something for me. <laughs> and then she said, but, but the dogs get the crumbs. The dogs get the crumbs. And he says what? Oh, woman, great is your faith. Great is your faith. Matthew 15, verse 28. To his own people and disciples, what did he say? Over and over again. O oh, ye of little faith. Matthew 6, 30, 8, 26, 14, 31, 16, verse 8. What a picture. What a picture. On his mission here, his visitation to Israel, his love was looking for love. His faith was looking for faith. Who will embrace my kingdom? Who will embrace that lowly is great? Who will embrace that the way things really operate in this universe is what I'm demonstrating right now. That's what he's looking for. That's what he's looking for. The absence of faith and love devastated him, right? That picture of him just agony rocking back and forth. He saw the fatal future. Where does the path of selfishness and self-exaltation lead? It leads to oblivion to death. There is no life without these, without faith and love. And he used the fig tree to show it, right? 24 hours dried up from the roots. This was not something that, you know, this was, this was supernatural. You know, this was from the roots all the way up, 24 hours. But let's not forget, there was another tree a few days later that showed it better. On it, he himself would wither and die. Not in 24 hours, but in less than six. From our sins. All the result of unbelief. No faith. His faith and love led him to give to that extent to show how deadly our absence of faith and love is. Things haven't changed, I'm convinced. Things have not changed. That is a vision into reality that we all need to see. It is not just for that time. There was not something, some passing thing that Jesus did. This is vital lessons for eternity. 
We are now in the global day of visitation, according to 1 Peter 2, verse 12, the exact same word is used. Jesus is looking over things now, not in Palestine simply, but all over the world. He's looking, he's looking, he's looking. It's a last investigation that he's doing from the most holy place. What is he looking for? Same thing, same thing. In his faith and love, he's still looking for faith and love. He asked when he was visiting Israel, what would it be in our day? Here's these words, Luke 18, verse 8. When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? There's the question. I mean, he, he wasn't just thinking about that day. He was thinking about the end of the great controversy. It's our day, right? We're in the prophetic day of atonement, day of visitation. Will he find faith in our day? He gave the answer to John, I'm convinced, in Revelation. Here's the answer. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. There will be a group at the end. Because of the messages that God has given to prepare people, they will see the importance of what God sees. They will embrace it. By his faith, they will endure to the end. They will have faith and they will have love to the end, regardless of what the devil throws against them. Revelation 14, 12. Is Paul's desire ours? Here's how, here's how Paul desired the same dynamic. Paul, he lists all of his human pedigree. Remember? Hebrew of the Hebrews, a Pharisee, the tribe of Benjamin, circumcised the righteousness which is in the law. He was blameless. But then he says, nothing, nothing. That's nothing for me. I want to be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ. The righteousness, which is of God by faith. Philippians 3, verse 9. Paul wants to be found there. Do you want to be found there? Do you want Jesus to find you keeping what he's given you? Peter shows God's plan, the trial, that the trial of your faith being much more Precious than that of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, the trial of your faith might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 1 7. Peter, again, he probably wasn't thinking specifically of our day, but that, that this specifically is, applies to our day, the days of Jesus' coming, that our faith might be found unto praise and honor and glory at his appearing. So that's why in Hebrews, we had this amazing passage that was read for our scripture. Hebrews 10, verse 35, starting, cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward, for ye have need of patience. There it is again, patience, endurance. How are you going to endure? You can, you can endure only by keeping what God has given you, of capturing his vision and embracing it and never letting it go. You have need of patience that after having, after you have done the will of God, the will of God is that you should believe upon him that he sent. And all that that, that that means, done the will of God, you might receive the promise. Next verse, yet a little while, where's he quoting from here? He doesn't say as it is written, but he could have. This is Habakkuk 2, verses three and four in the Septuagint, in the Greek Old Testament. And it's a little bit of a paraphrase because it doesn't follow exactly even the, phrase, the order of the phrases there. For, for yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now, now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Did you see it there? Live how? Live by faith. Remember, if you don't have faith, dead. Live by faith, die by no faith. Live by faith, live by faith. But we are not, he says, of those that draw back into perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. That's verse 39. So today, he's poured out his faith and love in giving himself for us. He's still doing it. If we grasp as we ought the events of everyday life, he is still pouring out his faith and love for us day after day after day. He's looking over things now to
to see how effective in us his gift has been. What has my faith done in that person's life? What has my love for them done? Do I see any of my faith in them sort of reflecting back as they deal with life, deal with others? Do I see my love reflecting back? So our appeal at the end, do we keep it or do we cast it away? That's our choice, right? We have that ability to make that choice. Keep it or cast it away. Live that way or say, no, I just want to do my own thing. Do we live by faith or do we draw back? It's my, my hope, my desire. I don't desire this near as much as God desires it, but I, I have to say it's still my desire that he may find in us what he's looking for, that he gave us, that in us that he gave us at infinite cost to himself, his faith and love. May we believe to the saving of our souls is my prayer. Amen.